producing for an international uh, market, producing cash crops for an international market. So those are kind of four features of the plantation as it is innovated, if you like, in the Caribbean. And I want to argue that that innovation, um, in fact, begins to spread almost like, if you like, a, a kind of a, a metastasis to other parts of the world. Uh, and right at the cusp of the 1830s and the 1840s. So as opposed to a liberal uh, glo a liberal, liberal narrative of, of global history, which is uh, this you know, historicist movement from the era of um, slavery to abolition to the emergence of free labor and emancipation, the story I'm telling um, is one of the 1830s, 1840s abolition moment not being one of end, but being one of expansion of this force economy. That's the, that's the point of the paper. That I'm telling through these four stages, there are four, um, the 1640s to, the seven, to 1713, uh, the period from the first capitalist plantations in Barbados to the to the Peace of Utrecht, and that was important in 1713 because it, um, after that point, there was a kind of consol political consolidation of the Caribbean, uh, a kind of truce amongst the European import imperial powers that allowed for, over the course of the coming century, uh, places like Saint-Domingue and Jamaica, um, especially to become uh, the centers of a, you know, of, a, of a plantation, of a global plantation complex. Um, of course, uh, I'm interested in future work in, in, in trying to connect this, and that's my own lack of knowledge, um, with what's happening in the Spanish Empire. We were talking about that, as well as the Portuguese Empire. So going back to 1500s, to Bahia, uh, to the actual origins of the plantation, to the Portuguese islands off the uh, African coast. I think that's where the story really begins, and I want to get there. It's just I don't have to learn Portuguese, so I'm trying, but uh, I don't have it for this paper. But I am aware that that is really important. Okay, as opposed to doing this um, in such a didactic way, let's look at it more um, visually. I think this makes a point. So I'm going to do this, and then I want to talk about some concrete examples to show how the plantation in the complex is, is traveling, and then I'll conclude. So, uh, here is an image of, if we want to look for where the major plantation complexes of uh, this early period were, we'd see that they are uh, in the Circum-Caribbean region uh, from about the 1500s through to the Treaty of Utrecht, 1713, um, actually all the way to the 1790s. Mostly plantations uh, in this modern capitalist mode are in Bahia, Antigua, St. Kitts, in Barbados, uh, Jamaica, Suriname, uh, uh, they're coming to Trinidad um, as well, of course, Saint-Domingue, uh, Chesapeake um, in, off the coast of, on the Virginia coast. By the time that we come to the 1790s to the 1840s, the period that is the period of the uh, supposed end of the slave trade and the coming of abolition, uh, in that same period is the expansion of uh, the first global expansion of the capitalist plantation complex. 1770s is when indigo is first uh, planted in Bengal. Um, and that's, of course, what was the first foothold of the British in, uh, in, in South Asia. But the 1820s shows up as a major decade for the expansion of coffee, coffee which was one of the main cash crops of Saint-Domingue, of course. The slave revolt, uh, the coming of the emergence of Haiti, um, meant that uh, planters fled. They became, you know, planter refugees. They went to places like Jamaica. They went to Europe. They went back to Europe. But many of them, some of them, actually moved to Asia. That's the that's the story that I'm trying to trace. And I think it's it's possible to trace where the money flows, where texts flow, and that's especially interesting to me. So those are my concrete examples. I'm going to talk about in, after this. Okay, so. 1820s coffee comes to Kerala, to Ceylon, today Sri Lanka, um, to uh, indigo comes to Bihar, uh, indigo which had been a, an American crop, a Caribbean crop, comes to now Bihar in India. Sugar comes to Malaya, to Penang, um, and of course to Mauritius. So there is a, there is a shift of 
plantation, the same plantation crops that had been uh, the, the, at the core of the Caribbean economy now show up in Asia, in the Indian Ocean. That is really interesting, I think. Um, now, this is happening simultaneously with the opening up of the cotton frontier. So the 1790s is when uh, the Deep South is born as the center for this, what would come, become uh, the coming of King Cotton. South Carolina, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, eventually moving to Texas um, uh, by the mid uh, uh, by the mid 19th century. Okay, now by the time that we come to the period after uh, abolition, the coming century only sees the expansion, or even the further expansion of this capitalist plantation complex, which, um, although it was supposedly or, or nominally now using the wage mechanism, we can actually trace the ways in which the force economy was, um, was still at work, especially through the debt mechanism, through the modes of indentureship that replicated uh, slavery in many ways, um, and through many other techniques of labor control, and the paper goes into some of them, like the company system, the maestri system, which were forced recruitment systems, the script system, which was a way of um, paying workers that was not actually pay. So I won't go into all the details, but we, that's, a, I think, fascinating, to actually trace the ways that the force economy is working in the guise of a wage economy, right? So by the time that we come to the 1840s to the 19th, 30s period, we see the consolidation of plantation complexes in the Indian Ocean um, and in Africa. So this, this is, to me, very interesting because it, it provides a way to connect what's happening in Africa to what's happening in Asia in a way that I don't think we do enough of, and especially because um, when we look at the rise of Fiji, um, of um, uh, the uh, expansion of plantations in Asia Pacific um, and that, that period in which Indian indentureship was moving to those uh, places especially. So, you know, certainly Mauritius, um, Fiji, uh, uh, East Timor, but also Malaya, Sri Lanka. You know, we have this sense of the 1870s was the expansion of Indian indentureship. That was the same period in which Africa was being colonized in a new way by European powers, and in which, especially after 1885, we have the expansion of the plantation complex in Africa. Uh, and we have the internal displacements of people often in Africa. It wasn't necessary. We have, yes, Indian uh, labor coming to Africa, although it was, a lot of it was Indian merchants coming to Africa in that late uh, imperial period, the 1880s and 1890s. But there's a lot of internal migration of communities within in Africa. For example, in Cameroon, the people of the, uh, the, the hills being forcibly moved down to the cocoa plantations on the coasts. Um, or the same thing was taking place in Madagascar. People of the hills being moved to the plantation locations on the coasts. That, uh, if we put those internal migrations in the same conceptual category as the global um, indentureship migrations, I wonder if that I know that that will illuminate uh, a, a kind of um, a kind of connectivity between what's happening in, in Africa uh, and uh, Gabby and I were talking about this, especially what's happening in southern Africa, in eastern Africa, in the African Isles of Madagascar and Réunion, that uh, I think would be very illuminated, illuminating when put into uh, conversation with the historiography of indentureship. So, we have uh, Darjeeling tea, we have Selenese tea, we have Malayan rubber, we have Javanese sugar, uh, we have Sumatran oil, uh, palm, uh, but we also have uh, coffee from Malawi, rubber from the Congo, uh, cocoa from uh, Cameroon, rubber from Kenya. The plantation complex is uh, exploding in this late period, and what's very interesting about it is that it is now being uh, overseen or organized, especially by multinational firms. So there's a section of the paper that goes into great detail about the multinational uh, involvement, especially in 
this late period. So it's not so in the previous period in the like, you know 1890s, 1790s to 1840s period, as I'm going to talk about in detail next. It was really sundry capitalists, you know, sundry planters, some of whom were refugees, others who had read texts about the plantations in the Caribbean, and their agency houses, which were these informal um, conglomerates, uh, banking conglomerates and administrative conglomerates. It was very, very <coughs> dispersed and very um, disorganized, the way that plantations were being, were being set up. But as uh, you know, historians of the 19th century have pointed out, especially people like Alfred Chandler, there is a huge shift in the history of capital over the course of the 19th century, which takes place on a global scale, towards increasing administrative uh, concentration, you know, the development of the vertical firm. Um, that's what Alfred Chandler talks about in terms of the administrative revolution of the 1870s, the birth of the multinational. And so multinationals were really the engine for the plantations beginning in this, in the 1860s, 1870s period. This is the age of Unilever, of Cadbury, of Roundtree, of Firestone tires, of Michelin tires and Michelin rubber, of Ford. You know, and these companies were uh, coordinating the production of cash crops for their, um, for their interests, for their industries, often across diverse plantation uh, zones. So, so they had this ability to, to, to coordinate uh, and this is something that you know, the great um, economist George Beckford writes about. And in fact, his book, Persistent Poverty, was, is really the inspiration for my current work. And he writes, and he, he explains in that book why it is that multinationals were able to create new economies of scale, right? um, especially by, their, by the way that they were able to link different uh, segments of industrial production and oversee not just the production of cash crops, but the utilities that went into uh, transport, for example, electricity, energy, um, distribution, being able to control production, exchange, distribution, the major domains of capitalist production, and having that now integrated under one large bureaucracy creates these huge economies of scale. And so that helps explain um, you know, why we see multinationals emerging in this period. And what's important about the multinationals is um, what's, what's important about the multinationals is that it's not really only a story about um, about capital. It's really a story about how capital and statecraft is interacting. So there's a section of the paper where I uh, go into detail about the various laws that are being passed by colonial regimes in this 1860s through 1890s period which allow for companies to, ex to capture, quote unquote, wasteland um, you know, legally, uh, and also to quash labor resistance um, with impunity, right? So, so colonial states are, um, you know, are facilitating this expansion of um, the, multinational, uh, the multinational regime. Okay, let me now, Move to my three example, uh, two two uh, examples, uh, uh, specifics of uh, how this plantation complex is is moving from the 1790s to the 1840s, and then I'll conclude. So I want to look at this um, first by tracing the money, and then I want to look at it by tracing the texts in order to try to make the argument that this is not just a metaphor. This is not just like there's this metaphorical iconic thing called the Caribbean plantation that moves to other parts of the earth, but rather it is a material process of, uh, of moving capital and mobile uh, know-how, which is, which, which is um, reproduced through texts. So this section I'll just read a part of. Okay, so Leonard Ray was born in Jamaica and owned a plantation there before departing for Bengal in the 1840s. He was born as a Caribbean enslaver and uh, right at the cusp of uh, abolition within the British Empire, he ends up moving to Bengal, which was the new British 
colonial imperial frontier uh, in the Indian Ocean. And there, he started a plantation in Gorakhpur, um, which is in Bengal. By the late 1840s, he had then moved on to Malaya, establishing a coffee plantation. Um, and he became known there in Malaya as the quote-unquote father of Malayan coffee. Meanwhile, John Horsley Palmer, born in St. Kitts, was the son of a military general of the East India Company, and this family was also a planting, a planter family in St. Kitts, a very powerful one. He eventually ended up in Calcutta again because of the displacement taking place through abolition, the abolition movement. He ended up in Calcutta in the 1810s. It ended up that his father had tried to get him a job as a, a what, what were called the writers, the, the young men who uh, were the men on the spot for the East India Company. He did not get that job, or it probably wasn't qualified. Or, anyways, didn't the, the, the patronage network it didn't patronage network it did not work. But nevertheless, he ended up moving to Calcutta, getting involved in business in these agency houses, and came to be known as quote unquote the Prince of Merchants, having established his own agency house which did trade, very interestingly, both across Asia and with the Caribbean. So he kept alive his Caribbean contacts, um, especially um, uh, in Grenada, uh, Grenada, and um, his agency house in Calcutta was doing business with uh, slave plantations in Grenada up to the 1820s. Now, it's interesting, there's a whole other side to this, is that in the 1830s, um, the British government, the British Crown, um, uh, decided that it would give 20 million pounds in compensation to those Caribbean planters who had been, uh, who had been taken, whose, whose slave property had been taken, right? Um, that today is some, you know, this work that Hilary Beckles, of course, has done, um, showing that if we wanted to come up with current day equivalent, we'd be talking in the billions of dollars of, of, of remuneration, of, of uh, compensation that was being given to these uh, planter refugees or, or these planters whose property had been legally now confiscated by the state. And we're talking human property, we're talking slaves. So just to, just to make the point that this Palmer who was in Calcutta by the 1810s and who had benefited not just from the Asian trade, but also from the Grenadian uh, slave trade, he actually got compensated in the 1830s for the loss of his slaves uh, while he was in Calcutta. So just, you know, that's, I think, another important point. It is not just that these uh, slavers were being compensated, and slavers were being compensated for the loss of their slaves, but that, 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 that liquidity was being reinvested, and we can trace that reinvestment in Asia. So, for example, John Gladstone, the famous case of John Gladstone, who was both a member of parliament and the father of the great you know, liberal um, prime minister Gladstone, he was an owner of um, sugar estates in Guyana. After abolition, he moved his business into the East India trade and established a holding company called Ogilvy Gillanders Arbuthnot and Company. Uh, this company received the slave compensation in 1838, and Gladstone, so he received some of that um, 20 million pounds at the time, and Gladstone reinvested that money immediately in creating a channel to Guyana for indentured labor from India. The quote unquote Gladstone experiment that I'm sure everyone in this room is very aware of took place in 1838 as 396 indigenous peoples who, indigenous peoples from India, meaning these were peoples from the hills of Bihar, the quote-unquote hill coolies, what we would call today the Adivasi community uh, of India, that group which is because of caste in India the most subordinated in, in, in Indian society. It's that group uh, who were his Negroes and who were sent to the sugar estates of Guyana as replacement labor. So this is a clear example of how the British Crown's liquidity paid to the uh, slave uh, holders of the Caribbean, that money is transferred to Asia in order to find new groups to enslave and then to ship across the seas back to those same plantations which had now been um, removed of their slaves. So it's this fascinating circulation of capital, um, but also of, um, of, of enslavement that, uh, that I think 
is coming to light uh, uh, you know, by putting the study of the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean into conversation in this way. Now, let's see here. I want to give you some other examples. Another example, I'll give you another uh, example of a slave, of, an, uh, of, a, of a plantation owner, and then I'm going to give you some examples of texts that travel, and then I will continue. So another example is John Boyd Tipler, who um, is very remin reminiscent of Leonard Ray, who I just mentioned. Tipler uh, was born in Ceylon. Now, so he was born in Asia, but he actually was sent to Jamaica as a young man in order to learn what was called at the time the West India system for coffee planting, which was considered the, 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 the best, the most scientific way of uh, organizing agribusiness. He returned to Ceylon in 1840 and brought with him copies of Labori's uh, Coffee Planter of Santo Domingo, a famous text published in 1798, and I'm going to talk about Labori more in a moment. Tipler enjoined in his, uh, in his writings on Labori that the principles laid, laid down by Labori, who was this French planter from uh, Haiti, so many years ago in the West Indies are those which will guide the managers of Ceylon properties. That's what Tipler said. Uh, Tipler expressed his deep admiration for Labori's methods of what he called, quote unquote, strict labor control of the Negroes, unquote. Um, Tipler, taking this text from Labori, and as well as the capital that he had gained from the coffee business in, in Ceylon, he subsequently moved to Malaya and established coffee plantations there. Uh, and he was celebrated for bringing the latest and the most scientific forms of West Indian coffee methods to Penang in the 1850s. So yet another example of um, the circulation between the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean, which has real implications for the emergence of the plantations in Asia in this post-1840s period. There are more examples in the paper. Um, but even these, you know, these examples in the paper, I think, are just scratching the surface of a bigger story. So that's what I would like to do in when I, my work, my future work on this, is to be able to get the full sense of how many planters were actually traveling um, between these two locations. Uh, there's, there's, there's enough to suggest that there's a, there's something of significance taking place. Now, let me conclude um, with talking about the West Indian method. So the West Indian, so it's not just that capital was moving, um, but it's also that a certain kind of know-how was moving. Now, we have to be careful here because um, as opposed to assuming that these West Indian planters were, uh, were somehow deeply uh, knowledgeable about how the plantations worked, we know from classic scholarship that in general they were absentee landlords, uh, J.E. Inukori's masterful work um, from about a decade ago, it certainly makes the argument very forcibly that whatever scientific know-how about agribusiness that came out of the Caribbean plantations was largely the work of the black and colored peoples on those plantations themselves. Um, the actual horticultural knowledge was coming out of the, the work of the, the technicians, the engineers, the field laborers, and uh, what we find is that by the late 18th century when the plantation complex in um, sites like Saint-Domingue and Jamaica begins to erode, sometimes forcibly like in Haiti, or more slowly like in Jamaica, these planters begin to write their own epitaph. Right? They begin to write uh, texts, manuals, which are very nostalgic about uh, how to set up great plantations, and they set, they situate themselves as the, um, the the experts on on the great plantation. In some ways, consigning themselves to history in a certain way. Right? So there's this whole literature um, of the rise of these plantation manuals in the late 18th century, which I think is very interesting. But what's interesting, especially for my purposes here, are the ways that those manuals, plantation manuals, travel and become uh, major uh, teaching texts for these uh, new plantations that are being set up in Asia. So I'll give you two examples. 
then I'll, I'll conclude. First is Elias uh, Monero's 1969, uh, The Complete Thank Indigo you. Maker. Um, d he discussed uh, indigo production in Saint-Domingue. Um, this is coming out of work by Prakash Kumar, by the way. It's not my own, my own actual work, but I'm, I'm um, drawing on Prakash Kumar's very important recent book. So Monero um, became what Kumar calls a staple read for the indigo aficionados of Bengal. Uh, now, while Kumar looks at uh, Monero's text mostly in terms of the horticultural knowledge that it contains, when I read this text, I was actually struck at uh, what it says about labor control. Because while half the text is about how do you grow indigo, half the text is how do you control your labor, how do you control your slaves. That part, I don't think we're we talk about enough, especially when we look at these manuals. That's not we need to we need to read them. I think for for their this quote unquote scientific uh, methods of labor control. Uh, Monero instructs, for example, quote every Negro who leaves his master's house should be furnished with a billet, and his business should be specified with the date of the day and the time he may return. Uh, he may, he may remain absent. Unquote. The Negroes, Monero catalogs, are quite, are quote, great talkers, liars, cheats, lazy, and so forth and so on. Um, they will do as little as possible, unquote. And for him, this is the reason that, quote, unquote, chastisement, unquote, is simply uh, a necessity uh, because of the, the racial character of the workers, that they must be chastised. They must be, quote, unquote, constantly watched. He goes on to say that, um, Europeans who find it very difficult to conceive how we make use of such kinds of people, but we have recourse to a regular steadiness to keep them in order. Otherwise, it would be impossible to make any use of them, unquote. And he's saying that because in this time he's responding to the abolitionist argument in Europe, saying, no, in fact, if you only knew the kind of labor that we have, you'd know why we have to treat them as badly, right? That's the, that's the, the, um, that's the argument that he's he's having, and, and, and Laborie, Pierre-Joseph Laborie, um, another planter from Saint-Domingue, makes exactly uh, a, a, a very related argument. Laborie published his work in 1798. He became a refugee to Jamaica from Saint-Domingue following the revolution, and when he began writing his book in 1789, um, uh, he still thought of Saint-Domingue as the great jewel in the French crown. There, there's a lot of recent scholarship pointing out that Haiti, that Saint-Domingue, what became Haiti, was not just any colony. It was, in fact, the, what just like India to the British Empire of the 19th century, so was Saint-Domingue to the French Empire of the 18th century. It was the center of its Atlantic empire. <clears throat> in his uh, preface, Laborie thanked the British governor for harboring him. Uh, and for offering his, uh, and he says that he offers his treaty as a gift to the Jamaican planters, offering them modern uh, knowledge of the cultivation of coffee. While the text goes into clearing the wasteland, the horticulture of coffee, the optimization um, of uh, agricultural production, again here, there is half the text, sure, there is half the text that, uh, goes into great detail into his modes of labor control. And I'm going to say that this resonates strongly with, Labo, Labo, with uh, Monavo, who I just spoke of. And it goes into great detail about the methods of chastisement, the methods of the force economy, the methods of extracting <coughs> coercively labor from slaves. To conclude this uh, section, let me just point out that both of these texts, Monavo and Labori, became major manuals of know-how um, in places like Ceylon and Malaya. Uh, I mentioned Ma Manovo was being read in Bengal. Laborie's texts became a famous textbook for the establishment of plantations um, in the 1830s and 1840s. It was reprinted verbatim in uh, the, Ce the Ceylon Miscellany of 1842, and it went through a number of editions over the coming decades. The term, quote unquote, Negro uh, that, um, that, Laborie, that Laborie uses was also reproduced uh, 
in the uh, Selenese version and was used to refer to the laborer in general, the, the plantation laborer in general. The text was reprinted as late as 1863, and uh, the preface from 1863 bragged, quote, Labori, though an old writer, is still the author on all that relates to coffee planting. The principles laid out by him so many years ago in the West Indies are those which will guide the managers of Ceylon properties. So I'll end um, with that example. Uh, the end of my paper, I, um, I'll skip these. These are just, okay. The end of my paper uh, looks, comes back to the, 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 the ways that in this later period, the 1870s and 80s period in which uh, in Victorian Britain or in Imperial France, uh, not Imperial France, but in Republican France, um, plantation commodities were being consumed uh, as the markers of bourgeois culture. I just reflect in the end of the paper on the irony that uh, while we have raced labor uh, producing cocoa, oil palm, rubber, and so forth, it is not only that Europeans are consuming those products, but it is also that forms of labor control in Europe are carrying in some ways the specter of the plantation as well. That's an argument I, I make. Um, I look at Burnville, uh, which was the Cadbury town, mm, uh, Port Sunlight, which was the Unilever town, uh, Fort Landia, which was the Ford town. The ways in which these multinationals begin to, in fact, replicate uh, forms of plantation labor, even in the quote-unquote imperial metropole. Um, and I end with that kind of interesting ambiguity in the ways that the center and the periphery are becoming both are highly entangled, but are also becoming um, uh, more blurred, the divide between them, uh, especially in the 20th century. Um, this whole project is an attempt to study global history in a different way, to find connections between uh, different places in the world in a new way, and especially to put together the fragments of the colonial world that are still today so inveterately kept apart, especially, I think, through the inheritance of area studies, that only, it seems that today, we still can only study global phenomena by, by routing ourselves through the imperial metropoles in terms of archives, but how do we see uh, global phenomena like the expansion of the colonial agrarian capitalist regime in ways that help us to put together the fragments of the colonial world and find coherence um, uh, through that pursuit. So I'll end with that and we have some time for the session. Thanks so much. And it partly relates to how you ended. Uh, you said at the beginning of your presentation, and I know this point is not central to your argument, but I, I just want to make a point, that, um, that the global expansion of the plantation complex after about 1840 was, um, you say, the unspoken of liberalism. I think you used the word, the, yeah, you did, the veiled domain, etc. Just want to make the point that a similar veiled domain existed in the metropole itself, in, in Britain. And in fact, very, very similar bondage, confiscation, coercion, and degradation to the order. Um, all of that was going, going on, of course, in 19th century Britain. And, no doubt in the other Western European countries. And that, I mean, 19th century liberalism is such a complicated movement, so full of paradoxes and inconsistencies. We remember that one wing of 19th century liberalism in, the in that period was busily engaged in um, revealing and contesting the veiled domain at home. The women's movement being obviously part of that, and lots of other movements too. So that's just a comment. Um, the, the other comment question, in, in your um, analytical model of the wage economy and the force economy, of course I understand this is an analytical tool, I understand that, but I, I'm just wondering whether, granted all the work over recent decades, about the many complicated degrees of free labor and unfree labor and the different modes, whether um, we shouldn't more be thinking in terms of a continuum rather than a dichotomy.
growing communities of the human population into forms of diselection, but to veil that uh, in ways that the stories of the selected community continue to be told and projected. I mean, I, and, I, and I do think that we see, especially today, that the selected communities are not, you know, a ethnically white or ethnically anything community, but they are, you know, they are the national elites uh, of nations around the world that actually share a lot in common. So, uh, at least that's where I'm, this work is headed. So thank you.